We are so glad you're joining us today. This message is entitled Grief and Loss and is part of the Dive Deep Sermon Series shared by Pastor Alan Galloway on October 9th, 2022 at First Christian Church of Napa. Hey, if you've got a Bible, I want you to open up to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first book in the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, I love some of the digital apps that are out there. Uh, Bible app, Gateway, Bible, you can look at a lot of translations all at the same time. It's fantastic. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 26 today. So the Bible, go ahead and open up there. Uh, we're in a series entitled Dive Deep, and uh, many of you have been sharing just kind of some feedback how uh, the series is impacting you. I thought about this morning, remember when you were learning to swim? And uh, you weren't like a real strong swimmer yet, but you were getting better at it, so you could kind of be in the pool by yourself, and you would kind of tiptoe, and you kind of get out there, and the water would get a little bit, right, right? This one is like dropping off into 10 feet deep today, right? All of a sudden, here we go. We are diving deep. This passage, it's a powerful passage, and each week we are discovering and exploring the depths of discipleship. But I want to say something. Um, we don't want to be confused that discipleship is simply having a wider understanding of the Scripture. That's good. I love the Greek, the Hebrew. I, I'm not at all uh, proficient in it. Uh, I need uh, lots of people to speak into that and help me have some tools to unpack what that means. I love to listen to uh, those experts with the Greek and the Hebrew language and diving deeper that way. But that's not what diving deep solely is. It is life transformation. It's a journey with Jesus throughout the course of your life. And today's word is going to enlarge our awareness of what it really means to uh, experience the fullness of humanity, the fullness of life. Verse 36, we're going to start, we're going to read uh, these 10 verses together. Highlight, underline, um, make note of any words or phrases that really just kind of jump out at you today. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. That actually means press. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. Keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, and so he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. He returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Father, we just come today under the authority of your word, Holy Spirit, the words that you're speaking right now in this moment. Jesus, we pray that you would shepherd us through this particular path of our journey. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us at very different places on our journey are, are looking to you and leaning into you today to hear from you. So Father, we pray for ears to hear what you would have. We, we pray for a wisdom and a discerning of what you would call us to, into today. Uh, we willingly receive what you would have for us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Every culture, whether that's a family, a church, uh, a business, a country, a continent, every culture has a perspective when it comes to matters of life and death. Now, for those of us who live in the West and have been uh, groomed by the West, we love life, not so much death, right? 
even though we may uh, magnify and glorify it in media, it just when it comes to talking about it, it may be better said is that we just don't like grief and loss. As Christians, our desire to dive deep, to mature in our relationship with Jesus, calls us to have a solid, healthy understanding of grief and loss and what that means and how we live out that biblical posture. Because when we do, something is revealed to us, and I call it a treasure. There is a treasure that's revealed through grief and loss. Just a side note, 63% of the Psalms are complaints, <laughs> grief and loss, right? Uh, Job, how many of you love the book of Job, right? One hand, right? Uh, it's all about loss and grief. Uh, Jeremiah, do you know what his nickname was? The Weeping Prophet. In fact, he went on to write another book called Lamentations, which is all about lamenting. The scriptures are full of this concept of grief and loss. But this passage today is one that is, I think, deeply significant for us. And it just reveals something very powerful for us in this idea. So let me just highlight a couple things and then give a couple applications, I think, for us today as we embrace the treasure that can be found in grief and loss. Matthew 26 is one of those treasured passages. Well, all of the word is a treasure uh, that you just kind of glean from and find reward in. I heard it said this way. The scripture is like music. Music moves your soul. Uh, there's sometimes music, like some of you like to have real energetic music when you work out, go walking, whatever it might be. Some of you want uh, Metallica when you go to sleep. No, that's a different, right? That we want music that is uh, soothing to our soul. There's times, and it just has this deep connection with us. The word is much like that, I have found. And that as you dive into passages like this, it just can move your soul. Look at verse 37. The, the writer Matthew says that Jesus had come to this place of sorrow. Underline that word. Sorrow. That word often can be translated Depression the word that we might think of today, he kind of moved into this place of just feeling very depressed, oppressed even. Mark talks about in his account of this story, the horrors of death coming upon him. Luke talks in a word that's translated anguish, like his soul was anguish. In fact, as some of you recognize, Luke, being a medical doctor, records a, uh, what we know as a medical um, uh, diagnosis called hemohydrosis. It's the intensity where the blood cells that are close to the skin begin to burst and your blood and your sweat gets mixed. It's intense. It's overcoming. And so when verse 38 says, he was overwhelmed to the point of death, he's living out the prophecy of Isaiah, right? Isaiah 53, right? He was a man of sorrows acquainted with what? Grief. Isaiah 53. Sorrow, grief. Jesus knew it. Verse 39 he falls face down because it's just so crushing. What's the Garden of Gethsemane also called? The press. Right? He's just coming to this place. Now, often, I don't know how much you've thought about this, but there's a famous painting from the 1800s, and it's a depiction of this garden scene. Now, I look at this. How many of you have seen this painting before? Yeah, it's pretty popular. But what I'm noticed by it is how clean his robe is and how bright white. It's like, you know, oxyclean. Um, <laughs> and he's just kind of, you know, somber looking up. There's a little bit of a glow around him, very proper. That is not at all what the word reveals of what that scene is. When it says he fell face down, a painting that would render this is face down prostrate. You've heard that word before, just grabbing the dirt amongst him, realizing that, you know, there's, uh, there's this pain that is crushing me, and all I can do is cry out and, and for you, Lord, oh God, to come. This is his physical posture, falling face down. When Matthew 5 says that he was poor in spirit, that's the image. You're poor in spirit. He's preparing to drink from the cup of wrath and judgment. That sin that has plagued the world since Genesis 3 has taken place. He is beginning to face his end. And this is the last chapter for him. At least the last part of this chapter of his life. 
the end. On top of all that, that physical pain that's going on, there's an emotional depth the, 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 on top of that grief. The loss of his three closest friends who could not kind of just stay awake with him. And then soon his betrayer Judas comes. His good friends that have been following him will soon abandon him. Those who thought of his popularity, who just recently shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, comes uh, in the name of the king, uh, King Jesus coming into the, the, the city of Jerusalem. They will turn and reject him. He will die between two criminals hanging on a cross. As the writer to the Philippians says, it is in this moment that he hands over the divinity and the authority and all the privilege of heaven in order to pick up, to embrace humanity and the fullness of humanity. Jesus willingly let go of those divine rights and privileges in order so that he might be able to pick up what it means to be human. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's often easy to think as Jesus as a superhero. Can you just picture Jesus with a cape on? Da, 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 da. Right? Now, I don't know if that's been you, but it's easy to kind of fall into that type of thinking when you think about God in the flesh, that he's impervious to, you know, slings and arrows and all these things. In fact, it's not on, uh, uncommon, not comic book thinking, but in the early church, for those uh, that had a hard time with seeing Jesus in his humanity, that they wanted to delete these verses from the Scripture. They didn't want these things to, to be in the Bible as we know it today. The problem was is that all four <laughs> gospel writers wrote about it. It's a central dynamic to their writing and to them telling the story of Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. I think the point is, is that Jesus experiencing such deep anguish, crying out three times, if it is possible, if it is possible, if it is possible, Father, if it is possible. He's, there's a wrestling with him. In fact, Jesus doesn't get his miracle right here. Maybe some of you can relate. You were praying for a miracle. Jesus didn't receive it, at least not right here. If it's possible, May this cup pass from me. This is what I refer to as two-legged theology. I've said this before. Is you have to have two legs of theology that are strong and secure. In other words, uh, as some would say, is that the Scripture, the story of God, is filled with these wonderful wows. Some of your favorite verses. Some of the verses that you memorize are like these wow passages. But let's be honest. There are some, whoa. Anybody read anything recently from the Scripture? It's like, whoa, what? Is that, I'm not even sure I want to go there. A few of you, yeah? In other words, for us, this story, like so many others, invites you to dive deep, to go deeper with Jesus. And what that is, is that your soul would be literally transformed. Yes, when you say yes to Jesus, it is instantaneous. You're brought from death to life. But there's a process of growing and maturing in Christ. That's what this whole series has been about, is developing this deeper discipleship with Jesus, not just living at the surface, as so many people choose to do, but that your soul was truly transformed, and it is transformed in a powerful way through grief, and loss, as we see in Jesus' life, as we see in the scriptures. And it's in two primary ways. The first is this, grief and loss interrupts. The second is learn to fall with it. Now, I'm going to unpack these. The first one, grief and loss interrupts. It interrupts your plans in life. Have you ever experienced that? When has it been a convenient time to face a crisis? Never. Right? Or you just look around at grief and loss. I mean, it's not just in our generations, but generation upon generation. Divorce and dashed dreams and disappointments and relational breaks and disease and destruction and even death. All of these things that interrupt what we would have as a plan for life and how we see life and how we want life to go. And what is startling is that if you review just survey of Western culture, we just have this idea. It's like, that just don't do Grief and loss, right? Anybody? Am I? Uh, hey, thank you. Thank you. I got one per two in the back. Oh, you're just scratching your head. Thanks, brother. <laughs> I mean, who 
wants to do grief and loss, all right? Why? Because we are winners. Let me say, I'm a winner. All right? Yeah, yeah, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. Who wants to be a loser? Losings for what? Losers. I don't want to be a part of that group, that thing. What is that? Why is that? It's because I think often losing means losing control. I told you we're going deep. Hold your breath. Losing means I'm losing control. You have to lose control. And there's like nothing worse. I mean, this is like just right under death is to lose control. It's funny, I think, I don't know about you, but I've faced, even in the midst of loss, in the midst of grief, is how easily I can fall into a denial of it. <laughs> Run from it. Any runners? Run from grief and loss. I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. Nah, 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 nah. Or one of the, my favorites, right? Oh, it's loss. Just rub some dirt on it. Get over it. Yeah, you're there. <laughs> I, what's amazing is that for, I think, Christians, and again, we're called to be different. We're separated. We're set apart by God. But this idea from the Western culture that we live in, that we've, uh, it's so ingrained in us that it flows into our Christian thinking. We want to have a bi- biblical worldview. We talk about being transformed in our minds. <clears throat> we would even make statements like this. We win. Just read the end of the book. Right? Some of you are like, oh, should I not say that? No, that's good. That's one leg of theology. The other leg of theology is to acknowledge that there's grief and loss. Don't deny it. Don't run from it. Rather, find the treasure that's buried within grief and loss. See, we do win. There is this victorious resurrection story that is the pinnacle of the story of God. But all in and around that story, there's sorrow and sadness. There's loss. There's grieving. Here's Jesus face down demonstrating the, the real raw emotions of what it means to, to experience a moment of loss, a moment of grief. This is so intense. I think for so many of us it can be shocking to think of Jesus in these terms at times or maybe just easily kind of bypass him. It's like, oh, that's Jesus. Of course, that's Jesus, right? He's Jesus. He's not denying the loss. He's not denying the grief. He's feeling the full weight of not just the, the sin that's being pressed down upon him, but he's feeling everything and what it means to so intensely feel like life is just being squeezed out of you. Have you felt so intense the pressure at times that, I mean, you're just going to, like, burst? The early church heretics could not fully accept the humanity of Jesus. They couldn't do it. They struggled with it. They struggled with this idea of uh, uh, who he was, being fully man, fully God, the mystery of that. So that led them to deny the humanity of Jesus. I kind of get that, honestly. When I think of Jesus and, and my hero, when I'm following the aspirations of my life, to be conformed to him, his image, I don't want to lose. I prefer winning. Anybody else? I'm winning. I'm a winner. I read the end of the book. If I was going to write the scriptures out, here's how I think I might have been. How many of you ever said, man, I wish I would have been with Jesus there? Maybe not one of the 12, but at least kind of like the 70 where I could kind of like peek in. A couple of you, right? I see you laughing. I go, yeah, I've done that. I've said that. I told that to you last week, Pastor Allen. Yeah. I mean, if it was me and I was leaning in and I'm going to write my particular account of the gospel and Jesus' life on earth, I'm going to turn it into a motivational speech. We're going to pump you up. Let's go. Come on, everybody. Hey, forget about those torches, those guys with swords and clubs. Eh, Don't worry about that. Just dig in right here because this is where we stand our ground. This is where we come to it. In fact, we come to the place where Jesus is hanging on the cross and says, bring it on. This all you got? Pastor Allen's gospel of the so, so good news. The real story is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? (laughs) That just kind of hit me right now. Why? How many of you have asked God why in the midst of sorrow, grief, 
plans being interrupted, not going the way you had hoped and desired. Two legs of theology allows you and I to, to be here, stand here today, having received the full revelation of God through the history of God, through the prophets of God, through the testimony of the eyewitnesses, to the personhood of Jesus Christ, be, becoming flesh, Emmanuel, God with, his, with us, the glorious king rising up after three days from being buried in a borrowed tomb to be declared king of kings, to rise and to rule in heaven right now, and yet at the same time, acknowledge, I don't understand all of God's ways. Some of God's ways are hidden or shrouded in a mystery. And something very powerful about grief and loss, it kind of helps bring you through that mystery. I mean, not fully, but at a deeper level, a deeper discipleship, a deeper relationship with, with God of the universe. <laughs> I wrote this down. It's like, the older that I get, the less I'm sure of. I think I'm the only one, right? I was thinking th this week about a dear friend who uh, a few years back lost his son in a tragic accident. Young, vivacious, a lot of life ahead. And to sit with uh, him and I had no answers. I can remember for weeks just after that conversation like, I don't get this, God. God, this sucks. I may have used a few other choice words, and it was just, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I had two different meetings this week with friends catching up. Both of them have recounted, separate meetings, both of them have recounted just how the limits of our lives kind of start to roll in on us right? We're just kind of told you can kind of do everything, be anything, do anything, and all of a sudden you face a stark reality. It's like, eh, no, not so much. Not so much. There's limits. And there's actually a process of grieving a loss at some of our limits. Some of us don't want to believe that, and so again, we run, hide, deny, whatever it might be. There's an unspoken message that I think creeps into the Christian thinking that tempts us to believe if life is not moving up into the right if it's not going in that direction, then you somehow must not be aligned to the will of God that you need to get up and dust yourself off and make it happen. I would just counter that thought with this. I think rather slow down. You start to experience that crisis. Slow down. Listen to the interruption. Because I think when you do, because if you don't, I think one, it's unbiblical. I'll just say that right out front. Second, I think it's just inhuman. Contrary to, is it Marvel or DC, either one, you, you are human. You're not a robot. You're an image bearer to God Almighty. So if you slow down, and listen. Second thing is just learn to fall with grace. Learn to fall into the grief and loss with grace. I think just like losing, who wants to fall, right? Look at the scriptures. You can think of all the times in the scriptures that there's a reference to fall. Most of them are negative, am I right? Even this one kind of feels a little bit falling down. Like, oh, Jesus, come on. It's because it's so baked into our culture, the opposite philosophy of bigger, stronger, faster. We're building the $6 million Christian. Like about 30% of you got that. <laughs> if you choose to dive deep, and I say that very specifically, if you choose to dive deep, because as I said last week, 83% of Christians hit the wall and remain there. They don't, they don't press in. This links with last week's message. If you choose to dive deep, if you choose to let go of control, if you willingly embrace the limits, yes, the Holy Spirit living inside of you is limitless. You and your humanity are limited. As much as I would want to be an NFL quarterback, yeah, that's not going to happen. 
even in my prime, that would not happen. You're limited. But if I let go of control, embrace my limits in grief and loss, I recognize that, there's some treasures that I start to discover that I, I found that were hidden at one time, but now. In fact, I just want to look at a couple things, a couple things of Jesus' life as he learned to fall in with that uh, grief and loss and, and what we receive as followers and maturing disciples and following Jesus in, in this life today and what it means to fully discover when God calls you to be who you are called to be, that you embrace that. There's something that just is so rich and rewarding when you know this is who you are. This is how I've designed you. This is your created giftedness, the uniqueness and the image and the likeness of God. When you grab onto that and you see that, it is so, so powerful. But there's a process of leaning in with grief and loss. First thing is this. It breaks your self-will. You've heard of the terrible twos. Have you ever heard of terrible 52s? It's pretty much the same. Right? It breaks your self-will. Three times Jesus was praying that powerful prayer. God, if it, if it, if it, right? Look at this small passage in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. It's this little passage, and I would call, call you to just dive into this because it is powerful. It's powerful. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Whoa. Whoa. And this is where it is. Underline this. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Submission. Hmm. That is a wow and that is a woe passage. I mean, just think about this for a second. Here's Jesus in his divinity, divine understanding, living out full humanity. I think at times, again, it's easy to say, oh, of course Jesus was going to go to the cross. Of course he would choose the cross. He was God. Uh, that was his destiny and purpose. It is important for you to remember something really significant, really significant, to remember that Jesus was filled with emotions like you and I have. Those emotions that you, you have inside. Jesus had those. He was fully human. You choose to say yes to things. You choose to say no to things. You ever choose to say no to God? Over here, it's like getting real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I have, right? This garden story says that Jesus was divine. And in that divine will, he knew he had an understanding of the Father's will. He knew it in his divine will. And at the same time, in his human will, he struggled to do the Father's will. Yes, I said that. He struggled to do it. That was what was happening here. In other words, Jesus is not fully human. He's just divine. Again, there's a great story. You can take a look at this this week for those of you who love history. It comes from 600 AD. It's about a man named Maximus. Isn't that a great name if you're thinking about having kids and a boy Maximus? It's a great name. Maximus. Because uh, you can go Max. I mean, that works for everything. Anyway, um, he was very popular. He was a government official, very wealthy, affluent, had a lot of uh, influence, became a follower of Jesus, and began to uh, just press in and dive deep in his walk with the Lord. And this popular teaching that was taking place is that Jesus was not fully human. He was just divine. And so events like this in Scripture, when they look at Jesus and his humanity and wanting to remove those, they would say things like, this was only put there for our benefit, so that when we're struggling, we might find encouragement to what Jesus, quote, showed. It was a show. It wasn't real. That our struggle, we could kind of relate. Again, he wasn't fully human. Maximus wasn't having any of it because that was not the gospel. That was not the truth of two-legged theology. He kept pressing in and became more and more vocal, more and vocal. And so until he got to the point where the um, emperor of the day said, you know what, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to cut your tongue out so you'll never speak of this again. I don't want to hear about it. In fact, that was not going to cut your hands off so you can never write about it. Maximus the confessor, that's who he is. He would not 
back down. He, he would press in. This is what is true. He understood that breaking of his self-will. Uh, let me, I'm running out of time. Let me go a little quicker here. Jesus also shows us you don't have to fake it till you make it. And I'm just going to say and go on record, that is the worst advice you could ever receive. Please don't give it to anybody. Well, Pastor Allen said today, right? Fake it till you make it. That is not what I'm saying. That is the worst. It is. Jesus is not. He's real. He's raw with his response to the pain, the grief of what's going on. Three times again, I want out of this. I don't want to take this step. Father, I submit. I want what you want. I don't want this, but I want what you want. He learned through that reverent submission. See, if we learn anything from the story of God in this garden picture is that at the fall, it is severe, but it is also merciful. And it may be the most defining moment of your life. And if you find yourself at various these uh, seasons in life, this is where you are truly diving deep with Jesus, going deeper. In fact, the last thing I said is when this happens, because I think we all go through these walls, we all face these times of grief and loss. As I said last week, it's important to have friends around you, some good, solid friendships. Jesus had that. He had uh, these three with him. And I love how Luke says it. They were a stone's throw, which I don't know if you knew this. That was actually a term of measurement. It meant what we would call 30 to 50 yards, uh, that they were a stone's throw away, which I think is very telling. If you're in the midst of a grief and loss moment, you need friends close by, but not too close, right? You want them close. You want to be able to connect with them, but you also need that time where it's like, I'm pressing in, I'm persevering through this, because friends cannot grieve for you. Good friends, they will grieve with you, but they cannot do it for you. This is a journey that you and I walk, and it is lonely, and it is difficult. And it's crushing and pressing, but there is a mercy in it. Because grief and loss has this way of just emptying the soul of the toxicity of the world and sin's plague upon the world that we know and are so familiar with. And it creates a space for God's presence to invade, to flood in, to cause a deep, deep transformation to our souls. That we are literally different people. Have you ever experienced that with somebody that you know and they've just gone through this major, major event in their life? It's been just crushing. And as they've come through it, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, they're just so different. So different. I've just observed that over the years that some of the most humble and compassionate people that I know have journeyed through grief and loss, deep grief and loss. And honestly, I would say this, the world around us, the people who have very different ideas and philosophies about life than we do. Maybe one of the greatest things and one of the greatest gifts we could give to them is being able to be real and honest through our grief and loss and expressing in a way that keeps pointing back to Jesus. So let me ask you this question. Each week I kind of been leaving you with a question in this series. Let me just ask you this simple question. How is God speaking to you through grief and loss? Maybe this is a grief and loss that you're currently in right now and you hear some things from the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's something from years ago that's still there and weighing upon you. Wherever you find yourself kind of in this discipleship path, this journey, this intentional journey with Jesus, where you find yourself, when you face this interruption, when grief and loss come in like an uninvited friend, I just invite you to slow down. If your tendencies wants, like me want to run, slow down. Want to deny, slow down. Want to fight back, slow down. Listen to the invitation just to wait with the Lord. Wait before the Lord. As the Lord in his perfect timing softens your heart, enlarges your heart, that you discover a deep treasure of grief and loss that make you complete in Christ. Thanks again for joining us for today's message from First Christian Church. If you'd like to take a step in your faith and connect with a staff member at FCC, visit fccnapa.org slash connect. To stay up to date on things going on in the FCC community, we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the FCC Napa YouTube channel. Have a great day.